And the same applies to the spouse. You know you love them, but you need to say it again and again. Like we got to the food moments ago, and you need to say this food is, mashallah, it's really, really great. Even if the salt is a little bit more. Because sometimes, as I was saying, she spent so much time bringing it in front of us, and we are worried about how it's smelling, number one. And number two is we say, as we taste it, the salt is too much, no? <laughs> salt is too much, no? What are you talking about? She just looks at you and her face flops. I've been at it for three hours here, four hours. I've been busy with this for so many months. And what is she going to say? Next time I'll try a bit better, a bit harder. That's if she's a good woman. If not, she'll say, never going to cook this again. <laughs> typical. Never gonna, it's typical. Never going to cook this again. And if you have someone who's very witty, the next time there's salt to be put in, I'll call you to put it. <laughs> so we need to praise the cooking of our wives. We need to praise their, 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 their dress code, especially. For example, I can let you know something that has worked for some people. Where you find some women, you know, they don't like to dress appropriately. So the husband sometimes wants to tell them something. There are two, three ways of doing it. You can either say, this is very bad. I don't want you to wear this. And, you know, you might have a response. But if you want a response from the heart, what you do is, you tell them, the other dress looked much better than this. You see, so you are praising one thing and that praise is not there when the other thing is there. So you have told them in a way that this is what I really love. And go beyond the limits in praise. That's your wife. Don't worry. You can say whatever you want to. Mashallah, in terms of goodness. Like the food, you, when you eat, even if it is a little bit this way, that way, just praise it, mashallah, see what it is. Praise the effort at least, mashallah, you know. Let me tell you what has happened once. They say the imam in the masjid said, in fact, two things have come to my mind. The imam in the masjid said, you need to praise the cooking of your wife, just like I said now. So the man went home and he had this meal and he was looking at it and looking at his wife and smiling and all happy, mashallah, and excited and everything. And when he finished, he says, oh, it was awesome. And the wife says, what? I've been cooking for you for 21 years. You never said that. Today when the food came from the neighbor, you want to say it was awesome. So he says, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. <laughs> it's like the other one. The imam, he, he was telling the people, you know, he gave them advice in the masjid about their wives that, look, you need to do this and do that. So the man goes home very happy. He tells his wife, darling, I'd like to carry you today. Oh, wow. Oh, I hope I'm not too heavy, darling. You know? So anyway, he carries his wife, mashallah, and he's carrying... What makes you do this, my beloved? What's happening here? Oh, the Imam told us, go home and carry your burdens. Mashallah. <laughs> you carry my burden, Mashallah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah People say this guy worships his wife. Have you ever heard that statement? This guy worships his wife. I see a lot of brothers saying yes, you know. Uh, that is not the meaning of it is not worship as in rendering an act of worship for. No, all it means is he obeys his wife's instructions. That's what it means. And I can give you on a lighter note, and I really like this because it plugs in. We are all human beings and we like a little bit of you know humor sometimes. They say there was a king and he called all his subjects the males and he says anyone who is ruled by his wife come in this line and whoever rules his wife where you know the instructions are not obeyed so to speak or they come from you as a man then you stand in this line so the whole community stood in the wrong line Allahu Akbar. they all stood in a line say no if my wife sees me in the other line i'm dead meat you see so what happened is they all got one egg each, an egg. They were given one egg. And there was one man who stood in the line. I'm the man. You know, in the house, I'm the man. 
So the king was so happy, at least amongst my subjects, there is one man who has such greatness, you know, meaning he has the quality, Rujula, you know, he's a man, you know. So now the king gave him a horse, brown horse. And the, in fact, the king told him, choose from the horses you want. So he chose the brown one and left the black one. And he rode home galloping away. Everyone else went home with one egg. So when he got home, his wife, he looked at her and says, do you know what? She says, what? Today I got a horse because I am the boss. You see? I got a horse because I am the boss. She says, okay, that's good. Excellent. So you're the boss. So he says, you know, I was told to choose from three horses. There was a white one, a black one, and this brown one that I've actually come with. This was the best one. She says, wow, you look great in it. You look great in this horse, but you'd look greater in the black one. He says, well, not a problem. I had a choice. I can go back and get the black one. So he goes back galloping to the castle. <laughs> and he says, oh, king. The king says, yes, what's happening? He says, I just want to swap my horse. He says, why? When I went home, my wife told me that you'd look better in the black horse. The king says, no problem. He took the horse and gave him one egg. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So the moral of the story is obedience. We're talking of obedience. People say you worship someone when you obey them. You know, people say this man worships his wife because he obeys. Wallahi, we don't even understand that. The example of Allah is higher. We can never ever equate Allah with any human being. But we need to know that ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also connected to obeying his instructions. And Allah will not tell you to do something that is detrimental for you. He won't. Whatever Allah has instructed you to do, and whatever he has asked you to abstain from, all of that is for your benefit, O oh man. Why is it that we want to look at it and think that this is very difficult when if someone were to tell us to do something that is not beneficial for us because we love them, we might end up doing it. Why is it that we don't show higher love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is another very interesting point that we need to learn. If you want to be steadfast on the path, you need to surrender to the decree of Allah. You need to surrender to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. What this means, it is explained in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says, Al-mu'minul qawiyyu khayrun wa ahabba ila Allahi min al-mu'min al-da'if. He says, a strong believer is far more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than one who is weak. And this is strong in every sense. You try and keep yourself physically fit, number one. You have stronger belief, conviction in Allah. You are far more loved by Allah than the one who is weak. This is why my sisters don't go on a quick diet. You need to be strong, mashallah. We said the other day, you need to have, mashallah, the milk, dairy products also at times in balance. And you need to have the red meats in balance sometimes, unless obviously you've already had your quota, as I've said in the past. For those of you who don't know, let me quickly mention, sometimes the doctor tells you red meat is bad, don't have it. We can modify the statement slightly to Islamize it, to tell you if red meat, if the animal was slaughtered properly according to the halal way, the meat is not bad, but the way you ate it in the past was so bad that now for you, you won't have to eat much more or your quota is up. How much you were meant to eat, you've already walloped it, mashallah. <laughs> no more space for that. So to say meat is bad, I think needs modification. That's not what is bad. The way we eat it is bad. Chocolates are not bad, mashallah, but sometimes the way we eat them, bad. The same way milk is a gift of Allah. Don't say any food is bad. No food is bad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal. But sometimes for us, the way we've eaten, other things or those particular items is what renders that particular item not good for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. There was one, one joke that I wanted to share with you on anger. And I thought it was very hilarious. So I said, you know, many times people 
do not relate scholars of Islam with jokes. But I think our generation, Sheikh, it's important. <laughs> you see, there was a man. And this is showing you the irritation of lies and falsehood. The irritation of lies and falsehood. There was a man sitting on a train. Now, the train was a double-decker train, a sleeper train. So he's at the top. And three ladies walked in. Old ladies. They walked in and they sat. So he's at the top and they're down there. And he's hearing the discussion, sitting, he's, he, they're asking each other questions. And suddenly one says, how old are you? Now she looked 65. She says, I'm 30. <laughs> and this man was so irritated, so irritated, so irritated. So she, now the other two knew that this was sarcasm. You know, she was being silly. So they were also very old, probably a little bit younger than her. So she, so she says, and how old are you? Now, instead of saying I'm 55, she says, well, I'm 25. So she says, oh, and this man is now even more irritated. And so they asked the youngest one, and what about you? She says, I'm 15. <laughs> that was it. The man drops down. When he dropped down, they said, hey, what's happening? He says, I'm just born. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. <laughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Really, I thought it was hilarious, something to take back, inshallah. <laughs> and uh, I hope and I pray that we've all, you know, learned something from this evening. I definitely have. Islam has taught us some teachings that are so powerful we can stop at every sentence to speak paragraphs for of every sentence and every sentence within the sentences of the paragraph that is explaining the initial sentence will require also another whole paragraph to explain it and we will continue now let me tell you why i say this i was saying moments ago that allah created us in the best posture let me tell you what is that posture Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tutin indeed I have created man in the best posture best positioning of the organs of the body now that if Allah is saying that it is a challenge challenge to anyone to come up with a better posture even for one of the organs that you have and let me since there are lots of young people here let me make your minds you know move a little bit in in thinking can you think of a better place to put even a single organ of your body than the place it is right now your eyes Allah is challenging you there is no better place to put it. Can anyone give me a better place? No one. I see smiles. People are smiling. Look your ears. Is there a better place to put your ear? Your hair. Your eyebrow. Imagine if we had nose brows. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and imagine your mouth, your teeth, your tongue. What if we had the mouth at the top and the eyes at the bottom? Allahu Akbar. Imagine when you are eating, you won't be able to see your food. As you are putting it up you will have to feed yourself from your forehead imagine if our noses were where our ears were we would be wearing glasses on our ears one ear the other one at the back imagine if the hair had to grow for example not in the place it is right now but maybe from our elbows we would need beards on our elbows and we would just think about it Allah says I challenge you not even the combination of your five fingers where the thumb is it is the best place for the thumb there is no other place that you could ever possibly put that thumb including the toes if they were the other way around we would lose balance Allah says Laqad insana fi ahsani taqweem. we created man in the best posture this is what Iblis became jealous of. He said, why? Wallahi, it's a difficult. And with us, we don't like to listen to advice. Sometimes we don't like it. When it hits us and it hits us hard at home, we still don't like to listen to advice. Let me give you an example of a man. An example of a man. And this example is only to draw the attention of ourselves. 
They say this man had his motorbike and he, wa he went out one day to sell the motorbike. So he passed his neighbor. Neighbor was an old man sitting outside. You know, old people, they like to sit outside in the sun and watch what's going on and so on. He says, oh, my son, where are you going? He says, I'm going to the market to sell my motorbike and I'm going to get so much money and I'm going to open a business. He said, son, say inshallah. Son says, for what? I'm going. Whoa, did you hear that? What was his statement? He said, son, say inshallah. What's the meaning of inshallah? If Allah wills. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَى إِلَّا أَن يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Surah Al-Kahf has a beautiful statement. Do not say that you are going to do something tomorrow or in the future, whether it is near future or afterwards. Without saying that if Allah wills, without hanging it to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the old man says, say inshallah. He says, for what? I'm going. He didn't say it and he went. So he stood at that haraj, you know, that auction and he waited with his motorbike for a long time and people came, they showed no interest in his bike and they were going and the day was almost over. Near the end of the day, one man comes and says, how much are you selling your bike for? He says his price. He says, okay, can I take it for a ride? He says, yes. He jumped on it. He went. He didn't come back. <laughs> he didn't come back. This man waited. Evening came. Nightfall came. Midnight came. Nobody came back. The whole auction closed. They told him, what are you doing? I'm waiting. The man is going to come with my bike. He waited. Following day in the morning, he started walking back home. He had to walk. No money, no bike. Now when he walks back home, old man is sitting outside there. And he says, my son, you got your money. You know what he said? Inshallah, I took my motorbike. Inshallah, I waited at the, at the haraj. Inshallah, a man came. Inshallah, he took my bike. Inshallah, I gave him a price. Inshallah, he rode it. Inshallah, he did not come back. Inshallah, I'm walking here. Inshallah, I passed. He said, hey, what's wrong? What's wrong? He says, I regret. Inshallah is the word I should have said. He said, son, too late. When we told you to say it once, you didn't. Now you can say it a million times, it's not going to help you. <laughs> How? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. So we sometimes are just like that word. Or like that person who didn't utter the word. When we are told something, we don't like to listen. When it comes back to haunt us, we say, oh no, this should have happened. And now we have a big mouth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Really, it was a good few days that I spent here in Doha. And I've really met some good people, mashallah. And I've actually uh, seen a lot of uh, people whom uh, I have perhaps met on the social networks. And it really brings a warmth to the heart uh, to see such numbers and so on. I see a lot of smiles on a lot of faces, mashallah. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, the warmth of the brothers and sisters here, the hospitality as well. And I will be leaving in a few moments, inshallah, straight for the airport from here. So I request you to allow me to walk out reasonably, inshallah, <laughs> by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And until we meet again next time here, we say, may Allah bless us all. And may He make us have benefited something serious from what we've said. Until we meet again, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, subhanallahi bihamdih, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. I have a lot to say. There was something I want to say about the parrot. Am I right? I think I did say it, but I'm not so sure. It was in the UK the last time I was here, but I'm not so sure where. So I will make mention of it. It's just a joke to show you that in Islam we're also allowed to joke. <laughs> For as long as the joke is not about any race, not about any religion, no matter what, we're not allowed to draw a cartoon about even the Hindus or the idols, nothing. Allah says, La yad'una min dunillahi adwan Don't ever mock at anyone worshipping gods and deities besides Allah. Those who are far astray, don't mock about their beliefs, never. Because it will invite them to mock at your faith, at your expense, without knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So, for as long as no religion, no race, you know, it's just a light joke. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
uh, grant us all goodness. And also we shouldn't be uh, people who pick on others and so on. They say, or it is said, and this is a joke, that there was a parrot that could speak. And this joke, before I start, I must make mention, it's not against women, but it's against people who have pride in them, arrogance, haughtiness. According to us in Islam, even your surroundings can pick that up. Your surroundings bear witness for you or against you on the day of judgment. And these surroundings, amazingly, they pick up. They are either in harmony with you or against you. That's why you feel very claustrophobic sometimes and you feel very uneasy, maybe because your spirituality is not, for example, uh, at peace with the surroundings. If, if a spiritual person was to enter a nightclub, they wouldn't feel easy there. They would feel very, very, you know. And the same applies if a person who has absolutely no spirituality, half drunk, wants to walk into the masjid, they wouldn't feel very easy there, although under certain conditions they might also experience the blessings of Allah there. So, the parrot could speak and it was for sale at the pet shop with a little window. Little window overseeing the pavement. And there was a lady walking with her friends, with, making a loud noise with her shoes down the aisle, you know. Lots of arrogance, Allah protect us. And the bird says, hey you, hey you. <laughs> so, everybody looks, where did this come from? They turn around and says, oh, this comes from this bird. Wow, you can talk. He says, yes. The bird says yes, the parrot says yes. So the parrot looks at this woman who was absolutely arrogant and says, you're ugly. <laughs> Woo, that was bad. She was so embarrassed, very upset, naturally so. And she decided to walk away, you know, blurting a few words and gone. The following day she comes back, the same thing happens. Hey you, hey you. She says, oh no. So she looks there, she hadn't changed her ways, she's still the same, arrogance. And the parrot says, you're ugly. <laughs> she decided, no, I'm going into this shop and I'm waiting for it to open and I want to take these guys to court. So she goes in and she starts tackling the owner. You know, this parrot, I want to sue it for defamation, I want to sue it for this and for that and what. And the guy tries to explain, look, you know, it's just a parrot and it won't happen and you know this. And then he calls the parrot in and says, you know what, this woman, you don't you dare say you're ugly again. It's going to be a big problem, you see. It's going to be a big... So the parrot says, okay. <laughs> so the woman was very, very excited. The following morning, obviously the parrot had undertaken not to say you're ugly again. The following morning, the woman walks down even more arrogance. Why? She's convinced that this parrot is now dead meat. You know, dead meat if it says anything. So she called up all her friends and says, right, we're all walking down the aisle together today. Okay, that's fine, let's go. And she walks with lots of arrogance. She hadn't changed. All she needed to do is just calm down a little bit. And the parrot would have left her. And the parrot's looking very scared, <laughs> shaking, you know, sees her walking past, doesn't say anything. And then suddenly, as she crosses, the parrot says, Hey you, hey you! She says, What? She looks back and says, What? The parrot says, You know. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, for as long as you don't leave arrogance, you're not going to solve the problem. It will scare, and people, even if they don't tell you that, they know it. If a parrot can know it, those around you know it. So if you want to be a good Muslim, just release those bad habits, throw them out, and inshallah everything will be at peace with you. And when another parrot tells you, hey you, you can say, yes, it will tell you, salamu alaikum. <laughs>
All this we will be protected from, including being protected from the jinn kind at large. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. For your information, jinn kind is very, very frightened of man. Very, very frightened of man. But when we show a weak link, then he gets excited. He gets excited. You know, it reminds me of a story. Maybe on a lighter note, we could mention this. They say there was a man who was very soft-natured. Very, very soft-natured. And when he was getting married, the people were worried that your wife is going to control you completely. Your wife is going to control you completely. He says, so what should I do? They gave him an idea. They said, first night, get a stick and we'll release a cat into the room. And as soon as you, know, you walk into the room, when the cat appears, you must just put your headgear on one side and start beating the cat until you kill it. And then throw it out of the window like a man and that's the only thing you're going to need to do. He says, well, that's fine. On the other hand, his wife was hearing that, you know, you've got such a soft-natured husband, you're so lucky. So what happened first night, they released the cat and the plan worked. He beat up the cat and she was scared looking at him. This is not what I knew him as. And then the cat died and he threw it out of the window. And he says, no, I'm sorry about that. He cleansed everything and it was all back to normal. Every day he would say, I'd like you to do this or else. Or else what? Subhanallah. Or else. As soon as he says, or else, she's worried that or else I'll get that whack, you know, just like the cat. Until some time later, she went back to her family. She went back to her friends. But you people told me this man was soft. They said, no, try defying him once. See what happens. You see, we're talking here of the jinn and how weak the jinn is. So what happened is, he says, I want you to have the tea ready at 7 o'clock or else. She says, or else what? Or else I'll have it ready. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection and understanding. Really. So how we feel that shaitan and the devil is strong. Wallahi, he is weak. Defy him and see what happens. Defy the devil. I'm not saying the husbands are devils. But what we are saying, subhanallah, is that we need to learn a lesson. When we have a perception that something is stronger than us, we tend to be overcome by it. Why? Wallahi, it is weak. It is something that is frightened of us. Let us understand when we defy this devil and with the Quran and with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will run away. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wala ilaha illallah, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wala